Yeah, you know, Abbott 2 just came out. I, I mean, Mamma no, Mia 2. Mamma Mia 2. Yeah. Uh, which apparently it's almost as good as the first one. Um, don't know what to say about that. <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> Will we? I won't. Welcome once again to Free Associations from the Boston University School of Public Health, the Public Health and Medical Journal Club podcast. For anyone who is as confused by the latest health study as I am, why people in the state of Massachusetts do not know how to drive in a roundabout. Are you guys, is there, is there any reason why people in the state of Massachusetts do not understand that the person in the rotary has the right of way? It, it is fascinating, actually. And the number of times that I have yeah. to stop and wait for people just drives me crazy. Yeah, but my, my pet peeve is people who sort of stop in the middle of intersections and ponder. Stop in the middle of intersections? Yes, like, hmm, should I go straight? Should I go left? Should oh, I yeah, no, that's particularly right? bad. Just, that is particularly gee, bad. I don't know what to do. What does my cell phone say? Hold on, let me check my text oh, messages. That's the oh, worst. there's a message from my mom. Okay. <laughs> Hold on. Anyway, I am Matt Fox, professor of epidemiology and global health, and I am here, as always, with Chris Gill from the Department of Global Health. Good morning. And as you uh, may have guessed, Donthea is not here. He is away, and we are very excited to have our first ever in-studio guest host, which is Dr. Jennifer Ryder from the Department of Epidemiology here at the Boston University School of Public Health. Well, welcome. Hey, Thanks. Jennifer. Welcome. Thanks We're so for glad to having have you. me. And as always, Chris, can you guess where we are? We <laughs> we are in the, the the godly studio. We are. Well done. I washed my hands. All right. Good. That's a. You're gonna have to go back to what episode three to Something get that to joke. Back there. Yeah. It's, it's a it's a it's a reason to go back to episode three. It is. Everyone go back. So, uh, quick question for you guys: Have any of you guys ever gone to the website of the Population Health Exchange? You know, in fact, I have. You have? Mm -hmm. What'd you find there? Uh, well, there was there was a great photograph of the three of us. <laughs> That it is, is a great photo. <laughs> it's a really fantastic photo. That's reason enough to go there, I would say. So this is Boston University's resource hub for lifelong learning. I really think everyone should check it out. At www.pophealthex.org, where you will find this podcast, as well as many other population health learning programs and tools. And just a reminder to everyone, if you go ahead and give us a, a rating on iTunes or Apple podcasts or whatever the kids are using these days. Uh, it really helps others to find us. And a, a review helps even more, especially if it's a good one. We particularly love those, but keep them coming. So now onto the show. So today in our first segment, which is our Journal Club segment, we are going to look at a study that looked at different approaches to smoking cessation, a particularly important topic. And then in the second part of the podcast, which is our deep dive, we are going to talk about surrogate endpoints and some of the controversies that surround them. Uh, and then in our third segment, which is our amazing and amusing, we are going to get into some things that have made us laugh out loud or Jen will finally lift the bar and talk about something that actually is important. I don't know what you're planning. Probably not. Probably not. So let's get into it. Segment one. So we're going to talk about an article that looks at the effect of financial incentives, e-cigarettes, as well as uh, other approaches to help people quit smoking. The study was published in the New England Journal of Medicine. The first author was uh, Scott Halpern of the Department of Medicine at the University of Pennsylvania, Perelman School of Medicine. The title of the study was A Pragmatic Trial of E-Cigarettes, Incentives, and Drugs for Smoking Cessation. And let me give you some of the headlines on this one. So Fortune says, money is the best motivator for people to quit smoking, new study finds. Time Magazine says, here's what scientists do and don't know about e-cigarettes. Yahoo Finance, why in Yahoo Finance, I don't know, says money is the best motivator for people to quit smoking. I guess I have my answer in the title. Philly.com says quitting smoking is incredibly hard. Pen researchers find one thing that helps most. And uh, Ria Novosti says, uh, Ucheni Nazvili Luce... Sposub vrosti kurit. That's pretty good, Matt. And I thought I would tell you that one only to impress you all with my, what does my that, Russian. Is that Russian? What does that mean? Yeah, I don't actually remember. My Russian <laughs> days are far in the past. Kurit is smoke. That's about all I know. Probably means uh, no collusion. <laughs> <laughs> probably, probably means exactly that. So uh, with that introduction, uh, and Don is not here in his usual chair, Chris, I'm going to ask you to fill in. 
Can you give us the uh, overview of what happened in the study, what they did and what they found and why it's important? Sure. This, uh, this was a, an interesting uh, study design. What, they, what the authors of the paper called a, a pragmatic study design, which is something we've run across a couple times, I think, in the podcast so far. I don't know that we've done one in quite this, that was quite this explicitly a pragmatic trial, but yes. Yeah. I mean, I guess the one that came closest was that, that opiate versus you know, non-opiate therapy, which they called the pragmatic trial. But in, in this case, what, they're, what, they're, what they mean is that this was a randomized controlled trial done in uh, as close to a real world setting as possible uh, so as to render the results you know highly generalizable to typical use and so what they did is they enrolled around 6,000 participants who were employees of 54 companies in the United States. And I think one of them was General Electric. So they, they had a, but they had a wide distribution of employees, and they were looking specifically at employees who um, were smokers. And so they enrolled them using a, a very unusual strategy, which was, which was a, an opt out. Something I've never heard of before. I yeah, don't know if you all come across. I. I know. I thought I was the my, when I first thought it, I was like, gosh, that's a little saucy. But on the other hand, you know, there's no there's no <laughs> downside <laughs> to to uh, you know being part of a, a smoking cessation trial. There's only an upside, I think. I, uh, we yeah, can talk I, about that. But we can, we, well, let's get into that later. But I but, agree. But like usually when you 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 know are asked to be in a randomized controlled trial or any kind of trial, you are given a long lengthy consent form and told that you know all these things are possible benefits and risks, and then you decide to, you know, based in, after weighing the risks and the benefits, whether you're going to do it, and then you sign. And so you've now opted in. Mm -hmm. But in an opt-out trial, you have to affirmatively say, I'm not going to be part of the trial, otherwise you are automatically enrolled in the trial. And, and since presumably you can only do this for a limited number of interventions that we consider, you know, not, not, not to have much risk. Right, like, like, I guess, a corporate smoking cessation program. Yeah, and we probably could have done it with the, um, with the interventions we looked at in one of our last podcasts, looking at the effects of, of menu labeling, things like that. Right, right. Well, in, in this case, it, it has sort of an interesting uh, nuance in terms of the analysis of the data, which we'll, I think we're going to explore more fully later. But, you know, people are, are passively enrolled into this trial, which means that, you know, if they're like me and they get an email that's saying, you know, congratulations, Chris, you've been passively enrolled in this trial, you know, and it comes from some corporate, you know, domain, and I just like delete it without reading it. So uh -huh. I so imagine you, so many people are like me, they were not even aware that they were in the trial yep. at all. Yep. And so they, their behavior in terms of their engagement with the, with the interventions may have been passive. Shall we say a or minimal? May have been real, may have been. real world. May have been, or right. But this is this is real world. You know, but there's a smaller subset of people who read their emails when they when they come from dot bu dot edu, and you are not among them, <laughs> which I'm not on. Who are like, oh, good, I'm part of this trial. I'm going to like take full advantage of this, and I'm going to be really engaged. And well, so wait they, a minute. So they they had to have been aware that at least something was going. They may not have remembered that they were in a trial, but they were offered an intervention, right? So they were at least aware that they were offered something. Were, I would think they may have been aware that they were offered something, but the, the but then there are people who are like offered and then enthusiastic, meaning that part of the the the, the process was that if they were really interested in it, they should go onto this website and then they should log in and like say, whoa, this is so great. And sort of affirmatively acknowledge that they are part of the trial and embrace it. Yep. And those participants were called the ones who were engaged, meaning that they kind of, they read the email, they responded to the email and they were like kind of enthusiastic. And so- did, I wasn't clear. Did they have to, did they actually have to indicate they wanted to quit in order to be in the engaged subset? I don't recall that. Jen? Um, I... Don't well now I can't remember. All right, um, yeah. Chris, keep going, and we'll dig while you while you. And anyway, you do so that. so th they then randomized these six thousand individuals into one of five interventions, um, which sort of represents, I guess, sort of like a tiered set of you know measures to help you smoke. So the first group was people who were just encouraged to smoke, and which they call the usual care. Encouraged not to smoke. We're encouraged not to smoke. Yes, right. So no. not, there was we did one not group encourage that they, people they, to smoke. They handed out packs of no. you know cartons of, of no, they didn't. Marlboros, and no, they, they said, didn't. Smoke all you want. No, they, they did didn't. not do that. They did not do that. No, they they had a usual care plus. Uh, and usual care was like you know you should give messages you should really not Stop smoke. smoking. Stop smoking. Yep. Yeah, it's not not a good thing for you. Now then the the four interventions were free cessation aids, which were things like nicotine patch or nicotine gum or some of those drugs that are used uh, and I'm blanking on the name that 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 help you like yep. I think it's bupropion uh, yep, I believe to that is. Uh, help you you know deal with the the nicotine cravings yep 
So that was one free free uh, nicotine uh, uh, replacement or pharmaco uh, drugs that would help you uh, deal with withdrawal from nicotine. The second one was um, free e-cigarettes um, as an alternative to cigarettes. The third one was free cessation aids plus six hundred dollars as a reward if they were if they had sustained abstinence. Um, and then the, the last one was free cessation aids plus $600 in redeemable funds, which are deposited into an account. And the money was removed from the account if they failed to achieve their target of not smoking by the end of six months. And there's some theory behind why you would do that, that, right. that people often uh, respond better to uh, the idea of losing something than they do to the idea that they could potentially gain something. That's right. So actually giving them the money and then taking it away might be more of an incentive than saying you'll get this if you do something. And a prior trial had looked at this. Yeah. yeah. Right. So it's sort of like, you know, here's, you know, I have $600 in this account and then they're taking it from me. Yeah. And that sort of like makes people feel mad. Yeah. And so they're more likely to go for it. Um, and then, so, you know, they, they unrolled all these interventions and let the chips fly for six months. And at the end of this, that six months, they assessed whether they had actually successfully stopped smoking. And um, this was based on a biochemical marker uh, looking for either metabolites of nicotine. So like in the usual care, they use a urine assay looking for a, a chemical called cotinine, which is a, a metabolite of nicotine found in cigarettes. Now, if they're using like replacement cigarettes or, or nicotine gum or nicotine patches, obviously that would not work because of course you're going to have cotinine in your mm -hmm. urine. So they use a different assay for those, et cetera. But it was basically the same idea that they use some sort of biochemical confirmation as opposed to merely saying, did you smoke? And then people would say, Hmm. I want my six hundred dollars, so I'm going to say no. I didn't. Um, so they were they were wise to that possible outcome, and they demanded a a hard bio, biological, you know, proof of sustained abstinence. Um, and so that's what they did. And um, the results of the study are are really kind of kind of cool, uh, and a little bit frightening at the and same depressing, time. Depressing, I would say. Um, sorry, can, going back to the, in, yeah. going back to who was enrolled. Oh, right, I think right, part right. of the depressing part has to do with um, who was actually enrolled in the trial. So these are just employees and their spouses at the fifty-four companies that participated. All of those companies used this Vitality Wellness yep. program. Um, they had to be eighteen, and the only other criterion was that Over they were eighteen. Oh, they had to be 18 or older. 18 Correct. Plus. That would be restrictive. Um, and it would, then, it would be very pragmatic, though. <laughs> very pragmatic. We really know what's going on with those 18-year-olds. <laughs> and then they had to report um, current smoking on a health risk assessment within the previous year. Yep. So they didn't have to indicate any um, interest or willingness to to stop smoking. Yep. So these are like real smokers out in the out in the world. Right. And so what'd they find? So what they found, and I'll, and I'll start with the sort of the, the rather depressing part of this first, which is that the success rates um, in terms of not smoking by the end of six months were uh, generally pretty low. Terrible. Terrible. So like the usual care, this is like, you know, you should really stop smoking because it's bad for you advice. 0.1% of those individuals stopped smoking. So one in a thousand. Yep. Wow. So... So um, it occurs to me that nicotine seems to be kind of addictive, and that might be part of the reason why these results are so awful. Wait, has anyone looked at this? This it it, it, it is. I think I think somebody should. I think you're on to something. <laughs> I think somebody should, because this is really. Abysmal. I feel like suddenly we're in. The 19, 1925. Uh, okay. Yep. You know, and, and yes, you know, with, but then the, other, the the more interesting part of it is that with each of these sort of tiered uh, interventions, the success rate uh, goes up modestly. So like in the... In well, the, relatively, <laughs> it relatively. goes up quite a bit. Oh, it's massive relative right? increase. Relatively, but we're, we, we like absolutes here. And the absolute success rate in the redeemable deposit, that is like, here's your $600 and we're going to take it away from you, plus we're giving you smoking so, sensation And this is the one that did the best. This was the best. They achieved the sterling result of almost 3% succeeded by the end of six months. 2.9% of people who, who had $600 taken away from them if they did not quit 
I guess it would be fair to say that a lot of people did not get their six hundred dollars. Yeah. Yeah. Now that that is sort of the, the bad news, but the, the the more interesting news is that you know, remember we had this this engaged subset. These are the I'm going like, to the, the stop guys you right who, there and say I disagree. I think you just gave me the more interesting <laughs> part. But go ahead. This is this is also useful information. But I think the more interesting part you just gave this, us this trial was probably much less expensive than they anticipated. Yeah. Right. Right. A, a lot of six hundred dollar rewards were saved. That's right. They could probably spend that on the next trial. Yeah. Great. So, um, so in the the ones who were engaged, and these are the, these are the folks who like you know affirmatively went to the website, logged in, gave information, and like you know were kind of like, yeah, I really want to stop smoking. You know, these are these are not the pre contemplators. These are the, the these are like the contemplators. Give me helpers. Pre contemplators, and, and their success rates were were better. They were not amazing. Uh, like in the highest tier group. Almost 13% of the men succeeded in, in quitting smoking, um, whereas down in the usual care group, it was 0.7%. So less than one in 100 still in the, you know, just giving them advice to stop smoking was, was not effective. Yep. But but the, the the engagement, of course, made a, made a huge difference. And so if we sort of think about the the, the you know the, the the larger body of of employees who were passively enrolled in this trial and i guess we would say are may not even be pre contemplators they may not even be they may be just like you know absent without levers i don't know what to call them um, these interventions were really like Completely ineffective, I think one would say. Well, yeah. and that was eighty percent of the trial participants it was eighty percent right unengaged. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Uh, big picture, it seems like it's very hard to get people to stop smoking, even those who really wanna. Yeah, I mean, you. I think you could interpret these results in I different that's not an epiphany. ways, depending on whether you wanted to say, you know, certainly some of the interventions were better than others, and so I would say certainly the redeemable deposit. And the reward approach did better than usual care. On the relative scale, they massively better. Um, but overall, we're not getting a lot of people to quit smoking. And I think to me, that's the kind of the take-home message. So, Jen, let me pass it over to you and say, what's your, what's your take on this study? Is this a, would you say this is a good study? And, you know... Yeah. Give us, uh, give us your, give I us love your the study. I yeah. think, Me yeah, too. the results are Me pretty too. sobering, but I thought it was, it was a great study. And, um, it seems like, you know, there's so much, uh, attention being paid to finding the right intervention for quitting smoking when it seems like the real work is at the front end of the problem where it's getting people to be motivated to quit in, in the first place. So yeah. the best drugs in the world, it seems, aren't going to help people who don't want to quit in, in the first place. And one of the things that drives me a little batty is that uh, when people talk about randomized trials, particularly when we're talking about drug trials, people will often say that um, we, we want intention to treat analysis effects because intention to treat effects tell us, well, we get the benefits of the randomization and they tell us about what's going to happen under real world conditions. And I don't buy this for a second because the populations of people who are in randomized trials are heavily selected populations to begin with. So all the intention to treat analysis is going to tell you about is possible what really happens to people who are already heavily selected to be in this trial to begin with, it tells you nothing about or very little about what's actually going to happen in real world situations. And I think that's what this study seems to me to to be the blinking lights are are, are flashing trying to say is that the people who who likely would have been in the trial if you had done this as mm -hmm. your typical randomized trial, not as a pragmatic trial, would have been the people who are in the engaged population, where there you do see a massive difference, uh, massive is the wrong word, but a big difference between the the people who were given the redeemable, you know, the $600 and then we take it away compared to the usual care, the the relative effects, you know, 12.7% divided by 0.1%. I mean, that's a massive relative increase. And even on the absolute scale, it's about a 12% absolute increase. That's That's kind of, you know, it's not great in that we're only getting 12%, but it's meaningful. It just strikes me as um, we're not really learning about what's actually going on under real-world conditions in randomized trials just by doing intention to treat. And mm -hmm, I, mm -hmm. I I don't know what else to say about that other than that's this just drives the point home for me. So do, do you think the issue is that we, we put too much stock in the intention to treat sort of like the concept or no. or, or, or that the, the idea behind it is, in, is fundamentally flawed and should 
be ignored. No, not at all. I'm not saying that at all. Intention to treat is what we want to use in order to get the unconfounded estimates. Yeah. Because as soon as we start breaking the randomization, now there are some pretty new and novel methods that you can use to try and get the actual uh, per protocol type estimates that that really can try and get those uh, in ways that that might actually tell you about what happens to the people who adhere to treatment. But leaving that aside, the intention to treat is going to be the 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 estimate that we want. But we should acknowledge that those estimates tend to be biased towards the null because you have these you know mixing between arms that. You know, this isn't the true, it's neither the true estimate of effect that we would get if everyone were to take and adhere to treatment, and it's also not the real world effect. Mm -hmm. It's the best we can do under most circumstances, and, and that's really useful. It tells us about, you know, the, the best guess at, at probably efficacy, but efficacy? Yeah, uh, Eff yeah. Uh, yes, I yeah, guess efficacy. so. But it's not, it's not, it's not perfect. And you know, if we did, if we did, a, if we did an observational study in which I could tell you, we did this observational study, and we had every single confounder controlled for. Like we know everything, we know every confounder there is, and we collected it really well, and we controlled for it, and we have no selection bias, and the study's pretty big. However, we have a reasonable amount of misclassification of my exposure. Would you say, you know, okay, well, no big deal. I'm not going to worry about it. Or would you say, okay, there's, there's, that's a, you know, it's going to factor into my understanding of what the estimates, uh, the true estimates are. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. I would be concerned about that. Sure. I think you would in the same way you should in a, in a randomized trial in which you have people switching groups. Mm. I don't know. You know, I'm just thinking, thinking back to, to my, my vaccine clinical trials days, uh, there, sort of paradoxically, we were always more interested in the per-protocol analyses than in the intentional treat analyses. Um, because we were looking, you know, of course there we were looking at, um, you know, vaccine immune responses, and we were really not interested in the hypothetical intention to treat vaccine on someone who didn't receive the vaccine. It was, a, it was, a, it was irrelevant. So we only really cared about, like, what happened if you actually got the dose. Yep. Um, you, you know, the, the, the sort of concept of real world was, was not salient to us because we actually just wanted to know what happens if you get a dose of the vaccine or not. But in that situation, I mean, are there problematic confounders in that situation? I mean, in this situation, you can come up with a lot of really problematic confounders, right? Yeah. That I think fewer. Um, I mean, I'm sure if, if we were creative, we could find a few. Um, why well, did they not receive the dose? You know, but but I, I don't think it would be confounded with your lymphocytes response to the antigen. So... It, it maybe matters in a different way. Well, uh, so are you saying that people who uh, don't get the the vaccine w might not also be the same people who might not be more likely to be exposed to the pathogen? Probably not. Not in this Why context. Because well, I mean, we were first of all we were we were looking at a meningitis vaccine, and so our our endpoint was not whether they got the disease or not, but simply whether they reached a a surrogate. Endpoint. In this case, the the pathogen is this um, fairly ubiquitous bacterium called Neisseria meningitidis, which lives in the noses about ten percent of any, anybody walking around the street. So yeah. you know, no one would know, and there's no like outward sign that you're you're a carrier or not a carrier. And most of the time, it's benign. And so the presence, like being infected with this, was was not an interesting endpoint, and there would be no like confounding behaviors that I can think that would lead the average person to go out and engage behaviors that would you know, make them more exposed to this bacterium. Um, but in any case, our, our interest was simply whether they generated a species of antibody or not at a sufficiently high concentration or not. Yeah, um, so, I'm still not convinced, but yeah. okay. But okay, but I think that's the problem is that when you go to these per protocol type approaches, you have to be really careful in uh, not simply just doing the per protocol analysis as just let's put people in the groups that they were in, which I will admit to uh, having done in my less enlightened days. Yeah, it becomes a very expensive observational study. Yeah, right. and, 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 and you need to think very carefully about both the selection bias and the confounding problems that, that come about. Uh, okay, so I wanna, I wanna uh, take a bigger picture. So, so there, were, there were, as Chris said, there were four interventions. So this is a complicated trial. Usual care, did, you know, 1% of the population quits, 0.1, excuse me. Free cessation aids, 0.5%. Free e-cigarettes, 1%. Uh, rewards, 2% and the rewards that you can take away 2.9%. So yeah. so so low quit rates overall. Yeah. The last two interventions both involve paying people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was a big bang for the buck. 
Well, yeah. I mean, we can we can come back to the actual. They did some analysis on the speaking. on the cost, but Jen, how do you feel about the idea of paying people to do things that we think they should probably be doing for their own health? Are you um, comfortable with that? I am comfortable with that. Uh, I mean, because in the long term, it's a cost savings, yeah. right? So yeah. I think that makes sense. And and we know that people are financially motivated. I mean, I think on a policy level, increasing the price of cigarettes has been a very effective intervention. Um, increasing so the price, we, though, is different from paying somebody not to smoke. I agree. Um, but I, you know, I get a gym benefit through my insurance. That's a simple essentially paying me to do something Mm -hmm. healthy, Mm -hmm. right? Um, Do you feel coerced at all by that? Or or is that just, are you sort of like, oh, that's great? I do do not feel like coerced. I think that just like these people, I think that um, if you're not interested, you're not going to take advantage of it anyway. It's interesting. I mean, the design of uh, that arm of the intervention versus the prior CVS trial that they described, where participants actually had to deposit some of their own money into Which is the a account. Better, is, is a better financial, but, is a better model because when it's your own money, you're even more risk averse. But I would they think. couldn't get people to participate. No one was willing to pony up their own exactly. cash yeah. to yeah. I mean, can you uh, participate imagine? in the intervention. We've got this randomized control trial and it'll only cost you X, <laughs> right? <laughs> I mean, people Lucky are like, what? you. No. <laughs> uh, you know, on the, uh, when you have to fill out the, the consent form that says cost to participants. It's Minus $600. $600. Yeah, that's, uh, that's a tough sell. In the addition re- to the side effects. The reason that I bring this question up is back in the 2000s, early 2000s, mid 2000s, in the days when there wasn't much uh, early 2000s, so there this wasn't much HIV the treatment. Early Lady Gaga era. I don't know the answer to that, Chris. <laughs> I'm going to say that I am blissfully unaware post of the Madonna the early lady, lady Gaga I know it's, era. I do know it's post Madonna. I don't know if it's it's in the Lady Gaga heyday. Posh that is, Spice. No, that was you, the 90s. Sorry. Uh, wow. Never mind. That was the 90s. You, you, Medical school there. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> Chris is now showing us his friendship bracelets. Oh yeah. And his sticker collection from yeah. the 1980s. Yeah. You know, Abba Two just came out. I. I mean, Mamma no, Mia Two. Mamma Mia Two. Yeah. Uh, which apparently it's almost as good as the first one. Um, don't know what to say about that. <laughs> we'll see. Will we? I won't. Anyway, the early 2000s, when there wasn't much going on in the way of HIV treatment in research limited settings, we would have hypothetical conversations. We never got any much further on this, on the idea of, could you, would you ever use as an its financial incentive paying people to test HIV negative? That if they were to, where they were able to test HIV negative, you would provide them with a financial incentive. People hated that idea. Hmm. People bristled. Some people really. The idea I, that you would pay somebody to do something, even though the financial, if the, the, the burden uh, falls on the healthcare system in research limited settings, those are mostly public sector programs. The, the cost of, of the care, which at that time was very little, but eventually became cost of HIV treatment, falls to the healthcare system. You could pay people to stay negative and avoid those costs, yet people just. Bristled. What were the major criticisms? That this is something people should be doing for their own health. Or, I mean, the other thing is so that eventually we extended to paying people to stay on the treatment and virally suppressed. Well, no, absolutely not. This is something they should do for their own health. Um, I don't know. I, it just strikes me as uh, we want to avoid the the cost of the healthcare system. If we can pay up front and avoid those costs, there's there's that's worth doing. On the other hand, we could potentially do this for everything, right? So do we provide a financial incentive for every single, you know, uh, negative behavior that we could get people to avoid and who decides which ones those are? And, you know, it could get messy. So, so do you think that that the objection to, say, paying someone to um, not get infected with HIV, uh, do you think that the objections are based on um, ethics, research ethics, as in this is no. an immoral thing to do, or do you think this is this is about this is sort of a uh, a judgment of moral behavior, and that you know we are substituting money for moral behavior, and people ought to behave morally, uh, you know, or in their own self interest. In and their that's own self interest, the I don't know about morally, but in right, their own self interest, yeah, um, yeah, and I think that's what it is. But it just strikes me as a strange one, huh? Um, so it seems to me the takeaways are we, we all really like this study that, that, that you, we don't often see trials that are quite this pragmatic in nature uh, and therefore really do tell us something about what's going on in the real world. Unfortunately, the results are fairly depressing. 
but I think this was a was quite a quite an impressive trial, and I I I think we all agree. I I um, want to just nitpick just a little bit. One thing that um, drives me always a little crazy is the use of of p values, as always. Um, and I just want to read you this this statement. So they say that with respect to sustained abstinence rates, redeemal deposits and rewards were superior to free cessation aids, p less than 0 0.001 and p equals 0 0.06 respectively, with significance levels adjusted for multiple comparisons, something that also drives me a little crazy. Redeemal deposits were superior to free e-cigarettes, p equals 0 0.008. Free e-cigarettes were not superior to usual care, p equals 0.2, or to free cessation aids, 0.43. The reason this drives me a little crazy is, first of all, just the sprinkling in p values like they were like it was salt uh, strikes me as a little bit. Uh, it, it it doesn't tell me anything. How much different were they, and are these meaningful in any way? And when you actually go and look at them, the differences on a, in absolute terms are are pretty small amongst the everyone groups, um, such that I don't know that you necessarily want to implement any of these interventions. Given the the it, it, to everyone, given well, the the low quit rates. Well, particularly, I mean, one thing we haven't talked about is, I mean, they were giving them e-cigarettes, and that doesn't seem to be very helpful. I mean, my understanding is I one of know. the. I don't know where I fall on that one. Really? Yeah, hmm. I think that e-cigarettes, from my limited understanding, and I'm I'm no expert on this, but from what I've gotten to talk to people, are are dramatically less harmful than regular cigarettes. This may be true. In which case... Because you're not burning all that stuff in, which in case, there. If we could swap but one for the other... I think the issue is we don't know what stuff is in there. Right. So, you know, there there's huge, my understanding, variation yeah. among the formulations. And um, and we don't really know how, how dangerous that is. And so giving... I mean, that is a, as a uh, intervention to help people quit seems pretty problematic to me, especially if it appears to be not really even very effective. All right. I'm, I'm going to admit I, I'm in over my head here on that one and I can't. Chris, do you, do you know much about uh, it? No, no, I don't. I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm with you, but I have a very superficial understanding. I was just sort of assuming this is a nicotine vaporization system and there's nothing else in there, but we know that's not true. There's all sorts of stuff, like you're saying, flavors, flavorings and yeah. odors and who knows what's uh, mixed in there to make them more tasty and, and yep. desirable, particularly to the youth. Yep. Um, you know, maybe there's still a harm reduction issue there. Uh, I'm a little more concerned recently, but based on some laboratory studies in mice suggesting that there's increased uh, bladder and uh, certain other adenocarcinomas uh, in association with e-cigarette exposure. Compared to nicotine? Compared to nothing. So that they are, so you know, they're the not, assumption that nicotine... Harmless. Uh, has no carcinogenic effect, which is okay. what I always assumed may not be true. But I think this, the the story is still evolving. Okay, I will. Well, let's leave it at that then, since none of us can uh, authoritatively speak to it. So let's move on to our second segment, where we want to talk about surrogate endpoints. Um, which, and, and Jen will correct me if I'm wrong, but the basic idea is that. Often when we're doing uh, trials in particular, we don't have the time and the money to be able to look at the long-term endpoints that we'd probably want to look at, right? Which is generally, we want to know, do these interventions affect your, your survival? Um, or potentially, if this is something we can cure, your cure rates. And we often can't do that because the endpoints that we're looking at are, are far away or the, the, um, the person time that we need to accumulate to be able to study them would be uh, cost prohibitive and therefore or time prohibitive, I suppose. Um, in those cases, we want to look for an endpoint that is highly predictive of those more clin clinically meaningful endpoints. And so we find an endpoint that is a surrogate for those more meaningful survival-based uh, endpoints, and we use that instead. Jen, you suggested this topic as one that we should take on, and Chris and I were both into the topic. Great. The question is, do you have a good surrogate endpoint rant in you? <laughs> yeah, I think Go I do. For it, then. Okay. So I would just one more characteristic of surrogates. Um, I think in general, we think of surrogates as an endpoint that doesn't itself have any clinical value. And this comes up in the mm. oncology space. Okay. So, so looking at, say, blood pressure as a surrogate for overall survival and patients taking hypertensives, there's no real value in reducing someone's blood pressure unless it's going to predict 
long-term outcomes, right? Mm-hmm. Otherwise, it's it's a waste of time. Um, so I'll talk about it a little bit more later. But in um, oncology, you know, metastasis-free survival is sometimes considered a surrogate. But one could argue that preventing metastasis is in itself an important mm-hmm. endpoint. Meds Absolutely. are painful and require lots of other interventions. Yep. Um, and so that's not really what I'm talking about here. We're going to talk about real surrogates that are, it's just an endpoint, not mm-hmm. clinically meaningful. Um, so I think there's been both a ton of uh, enthusiasm about surrogates. I mean, some people will say surrogates are necessary because it just takes too long for drugs to be approved. There is a compliance issue. So when we have to follow patients for decades, it is very unlikely that they're going to comply with um, the the randomized treatment. Um, and that could really complicate interpretation of our results. And our they get results. lost to follow up. And they or... get lost to follow up. Right. So there are good reasons for, I think, being um, being enthusiastic about surrogates and, and uh investing resources in trying to identify good surrogates. But uh, there are also a lot of critics. So, you know, I was just looking back and, you know, there's an editorial in the Annals of Internal Medicine back from 1996 about surrogate endpoints in clinical trials. Are we being misled? Um, And the perils of surrogate endpoints. um, And here's one that's global health related. Surrogate endpoints in global health research still searching for killer apps and silver bullets. Mm. Um, So I think this is this crosses all types of substantive areas. Yeah, it was a big deal in the AIDS world back in the early days of the clinical trials for new drugs. You know, what do we use as the endpoint markers? So this is I, I certainly see this as applying to. Pretty much everything. Yeah. So there was an editorial that was published uh, just, la- or an opinion piece, I guess, published last year in BMC Medicine mm-hmm. uh, by Robert Kemp and Vinay Prasad. Um, and Vinay Prasad, I think, has received a lot of attention in the media for being a skeptic of yep. all kinds of interventions and screening. And um, and so perhaps not surprisingly, surrogate endpoints are also somewhat concerning to him. But they point out in this in this paper a number of sort of interesting facts about the use of surrogates that I didn't know. So um, for instance, so this is just in oncology. Between 2009 and 2014, the FDA approved 83 oncology drugs. 55 or 66% of those were based on a surrogate. Those surrogates being response rate, tumor response rate, or progression-free survival. And tumor response rate means that it got a little bit smaller on the CAT scan. Yeah, some you know sort of arbitrary measure of tumor shrinkage. Yeah, um, surrogate use is increasing, so that between 1995 and 2004, overall survival was used as the primary endpoint in oncology trials um, in 49 percent of those trials, whereas between 2005 and 2009, overall survival was the primary endpoint over in uh, only 36 percent of the trial and was replaced primarily by progression-free uh, survival. And then, you know, he goes through some examples of where surrogates have had a somewhat questionable track record. So um, between 2004 and 2008, 36 oncology drugs were approved based on a surrogate uh, with a median follow-up of 4.4 years in uh, those trials. But 50% of those failed to um, be associated with overall survival in subsequent trials. So half of them. Only one of them, one of the 18, um, even had an improvement in quality of life. Uh, Two had reduced quality of life, and most didn't even look at quality of life. 36% had sort of uncertain effects on survival. Five of the studies, so 14%, demonstrated an improved survival. And then, um, but of those, only one of those drugs one of the 36 that was uh, approved based on a surrogate has actually been removed from the market subsequently. Because it wasn't effective? It was actually harmful. Or because it was actually harmful. But but what we can assume is that there are lots of drugs out there that aren't effective in terms of what we really care about, which is overall survival. And, are, and, and these are costly, costly drugs. It, you of know, course, it, yeah. 100000 you know, 200000 dollars per patient per year uh, in many cases Oof. or more. So, you know, and another interesting point that they bring up in this article that I hadn't thought of is 
Another possible outcome of this sur- of using surrogates rather than something like overall survival is who is going to be enrolled on these trials. So traditionally, if we were going to look at overall survival, we might include patients with worse tumors, mm-hmm. right? Um, less favorable outcomes, because then we would get to that overall survival endpoint more quickly. Whereas if now we're using surrogates, the trials might enroll patients with more favorable early disease. And that would be particularly appealing to pharmaceutical companies because that represents a larger market share. Mm -hmm. So in the end, one of the main goals of surrogates, which is to more expeditiously be able to approve these these drugs would actually not even be realized because now we're just using a different patient population but having to follow them for the same amount of time. So it was an interesting idea that I hadn't considered. Yep. And then they provide in this um, in this paper a number of recommendations, um, and really they all revolve around proper validation of of surrogates, um, which seems which seems fair. Yep. Um, and the final recommendation being that surrogates are uh, used only after ongoing studies that are measuring those hard endpoints have been fully recruited. Mm-hmm. And that's so mm-hmm. that we could at least, you know, relatively soon after you're using that surrogate, evaluate it with respect to the true endpoint. So what do you, what do you guys think? Well, so I, this is this is not a topic that I am deeply immersed in. I bet I'm going to assume Chris has more experience with this. But I have to say I'm not all that surprised largely because it seems to me that we are generally not actually very good at prediction in epidemiology. Now, I know I'm going to get a lot of hate mail for saying that because we do have all these new, fancy machine learning type methods that are really supposed to be massive improvements on prediction. But that's not really what we're talking about here. We're talking about a single endpoint being able to stand in for another one. And when we do that in epi, you know, we're not generally very good at predicting one thing from another. And so the idea that this these surrogate endpoints would be good stand-ins for long-term endpoints doesn't really surprise me. Chris, you 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 have some experience with surrogate endpoints in your career? Yeah. So um, I guess I wanted to point out historically that we have fallen into this trap of loving our surrogate endpoints mm-hmm. too much mm-hmm. uh, repeatedly in the past. Repeatedly. And repeatedly. So I, I guess a couple of notable examples I want to highlight. Yep. Um, you know, several decades ago, you know, when there was research being done on patients who had sudden cardiac death, which is when your heart goes into a, a terminal rhythm, like ventricular tachycardia or ventricular fibrillation, and your heart stops and you, you die. It's not, a, it's not a heart attack. and It can be triggered by a heart attack, but it's not a heart attack per se. It was noticed epidemiologically that patients who were at risk of sudden cardiac death often had these abnormal findings on EKGs called premature ventricular contractions, which were like big spikes on the EKG. I have that. Um, so we'll get back to you. Am I going to hate what I'll you talk, say next? I'll talk to you afterwards. <laughs> um, so there's a there was a drug um, called flecainide, which was highly effective at normalizing the EKG and getting rid of the premature ventricular contractions. And the theory was that the PVCs were the smoke that led to the fire, which was the sudden cardiac death. And so they did a randomized control trial, which they had to stop early because the flecainide treated patients were dying of sudden cardiac death at a much higher rate. So yes, their EKGs looked beautiful before they died, but what they were doing was basically putting a big you know, fan to blow away the smoke treating without the, actually modifying the disease. In fact, they're exacting the disease. symptom, not the not right. cause. And so there's an example of where the surrogate marker turned out not to be something you would actually want to treat. Um, another good one would be um, the use of non-statin mm-hmm. cholesterol drugs for reducing cardiovascular disease in patients who've maxed out their atorvastatin, their Lipitor dose, and their cholesterol is still very high. And they try to drive it down further by using other mechanisms to reduce cholesterol, like blocking its binding. And in Pre, you know, in phase two trials, these drugs are magnificent and normalizing the cholesterol levels. But in large phase three trials where they were powered on hard clinical endpoints like heart attack, they actually increased the risk of heart attack. And so it was, again, where we, we love the marker, the cholesterol, as being somehow this magical thing that tells us about this very complicated biological process underneath it. So I think we, we, we need to be very careful in, in clinical epidemiology and medicine that we, we do not overemphasize the, the, the interpretation of these, these, these surrogates, which in fact may not even be surrogates. And this leads me to my second point, which is coming from the vaccinology perspective. We had sort of a tiered structure for looking at our immunologic markers. At the highest level of you know, evidence were, were what we would call surrogate 
markers of immunogenicity, where the mechanism, the immunologic mechanism that leads to protection of the disease had been defined. Like, you know, in the case of the meningitis vaccine, if you had serum bactericidal antibodies above four or a titer of four or eight, you would be resistant to meningitis. And so you could substitute that in a vaccine trial from incidences of actual meningitis, which is a very rare disease. So it would be hard to do that trial. And you can get away with that because you know for sure that this immune mechanism is protective against that disease. But down the, the, the hierarchy, you have what we would call correlates protection, where there is an association, a statistical association between the presence of this immune response and the, the disease you're, you're interested in. But you are not certain of the direction of causality. So what, is this, mm. is this mm. a true, true, and unrelated? Or is this a part of a causal pathway? Or are these just like bystander events? You just don't know for sure. And so it, it feels to me like when we're talking in oncology about surrogates of, of outcome for clinical trials, those actually feel a lot to more, more to me like what we would call a correlate. Um, in the vaccinology world. Well, I think this gets into how do we validate our our surrogates. Yep. And I think this will allow us to put our causal inference hats on for a second. So there are a number of different methods that have evolved. So it started with something that people may have heard of, the Prentice criteria. It was based on a paper by Ross Prentice that was published in 1989. But basically, um, that paper said that in order for a surrogate to be a real surrogate, it needs to be correlated with the outcome of interest. It's shown to be lead to survival. Well, not even lead to, but it just they just need to be related yep. to each other. But then the other piece of it was that the treatment effect on the real clinical outcome of interest had to be fully captured when, with that sur surrogate. So I'm like drawing, drawing the dag in my head. So basically you want... A, it to be a indirect effect through the surrogate to the outcome a causal with pathway. no separate direct effect going directly from the treatment to the outcome. Of, yeah, yeah, right. So, but that is really hard to find. Unusual. So, yes. So it's been criticized for being just too strict, unattainable. Too in the sky. So, you know, the methods have evolved. So now there are other things like the pr proportion of treatment effects that it is explained by the surrogate. And then there are these, what I have seen most often in the literature lately, um, are these individual and trial level surrogacy association measures that are used. Um, it's a meta-analytic approach, essentially. Um, so basically, there is an R squared on the individual level, so mm -hmm. on the patient level, and that's used to quantify the correlation between the surrogate and the clinical outcome of interest. Survival, for example. Exactly. Yep. Say overall survival. And then there is an R squared measure on the trial level that captures the actual effect of treatment on the surrogate and the effect of treatment on overall survival or whatever the real endpoint is. And then using that, you can you can then get to this, uh, what's called a th surrogate threshold effect, which is basically the minimum effect you would need to see on the surrogate in order to then see an effect on your true, on your true outcome. But all of those methods basically involve conditioning on the uh, surrogate. So conditioning on a post-randomization variable, mm -hmm, right? Which is problematic. Which is problematic because now the effects we're estimating aren't causal, right? And you can think of that in a couple different ways. One way is there could be a confounder of the surrogate outcome relationship, right? And I think it's really easy to come up with examples like this. So in prostate cancer, um, if we use prostate-specific antigen, people have tried to do this as a surrogate. So if you have a rise in PSA after treatment, you know, would that be a surrogate for overall survival? But we know things like BMI affect your PSA level and also your survival from prostate cancer. And so those results would be confounded. Um, but there are actually newer tools based on principal stratification um, that allow you to evaluate surrogates and estimate causal effects. Mm. Um, but these have not, these are really only found in the biostatistical literature. They have not made it to um, the oncology field. I don't know about global health at no. all. No. And there's no discussion of are the methods that we're using to validate surrogates correct? It's just we should validate them. Yeah. Wow. 
Um, so there's a lot, I mean, there's, there's a lot going on there and it, it does strike me that this is something that needs a lot more attention if we are going to continue to use these as the endpoints that we use in clinical trials that have, uh, that are very expensive to do and have huge implications for, for clinical practice. So why don't we, why don't we leave that there? But I, I expect that this is a topic that we may want to come back to at some point because it seems to me there's a lot more to to chew on. So let's um, let's get into our last segment, which is our amazing and amusing, where we want to highlight some of the things that make us enjoy our jobs even more than we already do, the weird and wacky things that happen in our field, as well as some of those that inspire us. And I want to, so I have uh, asked Jen to, uh, for, to do something very specific for her um, amazing and amusing, which is, so if you go back to the very, very, very first episode of this podcast, my amazing and amusing was uh, a BMJ Christmas edition paper on uh, the the term was I can't can't say it anosmia and and anosmia and, anosmia uh, the idea that so the the how would you describe it that that you can't smell you the ability can't, right. the ability to smell that certain smell we're talking about asparagus again that comes yeah. about when a person eats asparagus yeah. some people can smell it some people cannot smell it. Yeah, if you remember that, you remember back to yeah, this, this Chris? is a burning issue. Yeah, Oof. so <laughs> I asked uh, Jen if she would go into some of the backstory on that because, as Excellent. you may remember, Jen was an author on that paper. Oh my God, I did not know that. Yes. congratulations, that was stellar work. <laughs> so you. give us give us the story as to where that came from. Yeah, so um, I don't know anyone else who's ever had a BMJ. Christmas edition paper. It, it is uh, a pinnacle of, of one's career. Yes, getting getting that Christmas issue paper. So, um, and it had been sort of a lifelong dream of my of my mentor. So, so that Absolutely. was a very big deal. Um, so, this all started on a work trip. It was a retreat for a group that I was involved in called Top Cap. I should remember what that acronym stand, stands for, but I don't. It starts with transdisciplinary and ends with prostate cancer. Um, but we were on a retreat uh, in Sweden, a big group of us. Wow. There were Americans and Swedes and Italians. Did you have um, lingonberry jam? Oh, of course. Love it. Yes. Love the Langenberry. Uh, but we we were at a very lovely um, dinner. We had actually, it was kind of a team building competition where we formed into teams and um, cooked our own dinner. It was like a cooking class. Ooh, that's yeah. fun. Yes. Prostate cancer research, researchers have all the fun. Didn't know that. Yeah. And so our meal involved asparagus. Uh-huh. And it also involved wine. And uh, after the meal, <laughs> put those two together. Someone mentioned, "Wow, I just urinated, and my pee smells so funny from that asparagus." Mm -hmm. Many of our European colleagues had no idea what we were talking hmm. about. They so said, genetics. Yes. Wow. So we thought there must be a genetic component to this. We happen to have existing GWAS data from the health professionals follow-up study and convinced the uh, PIs on the HPFS. They had a little space on the questionnaire. So we added <laughs> two questions on the questionnaire about whether or not a person ate asparagus and whether or not they noticed an odor after eating Get asparagus. out. And that is how the study happened. <gasps> Did wow. you get any resistance to adding those questions? Uh, no. I mean, I think we that's... were fortunate that it occurred in a year where there was, you know, a third of a page of space. So it didn't that's cost anyone so anything. Uh, but there has been, there was uh, not directed at me, but to the senior author, there was oh, quite this, yeah. a bit of hate mail about, you know, is this an important scientific question? Should federal research funds be devoted to you know, something that doesn't really have any... Well, let's face it, it didn't exactly cost anything. To, to, no. I mean, not I really. Mean, post, a second of people's time. Postdoc yeah. time, right? But but it was a valuable learning and experience for sure. And people wanted to know. And absolutely. Everyone absolutely. wants to know. Yeah. So the, the sad thing is that the company 23andMe did also had published a um, similar analysis prior to us. Um, so, you know, in that way... We confirmed what they found and then found one additional um, gene. gene that was associated um, or loci that was associated with. That's with fantastic. That's anosmia. amazing. Yeah. I, I think this is great. It puts you in the pantheon of awesomeness. 
Thank you so much. Yeah, that is so cool. Wow. Wow. Thank that you. That is really, I'm, I'm totally impressed. <laughs> All right. Chris, I what do you, whatever we say from now, it's going to be a disappointment. So true. <laughs> but you could say that about any of these episodes. Well, all right. I'm going to try. I'm going to talk about uh, about how our bodies, a little bit about how our bodies change. So I, you know, I'm a, I used to be a clarinet player. And Didn't you, know, know you, that. you hold your clarinet on with your right hand. And so clarinet players get a, a callus. Oh, yeah. I see that. Yeah. Do you see difference? Sure. Yeah. Right to left. Yeah. Now, I used to play all the way through high school and college, but I haven't played really in 20, 30 years. And the callus is still there. So there's an actual physical change in the bone that will never resolve hmm. because no, of, wow. of early clarinet exposure. So that could be a, a great paper to write, too, for the geno- genome-wide associations. Hmm. Anyway. There you um, go. Uh, this all comes back to um, uh, the fact that I live in a horse farm, and I'm sort of curious about horses because they are. Wait, what now? Um, horse farm. You live you in a horse live farm. On I, a I horse? live in a horse farm, but they're not my horses. They're they're boarded by um, a, a a demographic, which is very narrow of, of um, wealthy people from Lincoln and Wellesley and Weston who Got board it. their horses near my house, and so they <laughs> run around and occasionally they jump over the fence and run around my yard, um, which is exciting. So. <laughs> But none of that really has anything to do with this. Doubt it, yeah. I'm going to talk about a paper which is called The Origins of Equine Dentistry. Um, of so course you are. Dentistry in, in, you know, in horses is, is practiced widely because horses, if they have problems with their mouths, will, will get into all sorts of trouble. And they get cranky and they bite and they also can, can die. Um, now, th- when I was talking about the, the structure equals form, like the use equals form, there are like when you do things to a person or to a, or to a body repetitively or to a horse repetitively, there will be physically physical changes in the animal that can be represented in the skeleton many, many years later. So we know that horses, uh, domestication of horses began in the steppes of Kazakhstan around 3500 BCE with the Mongolians. Um, and one has to imagine that at the beginning when they're like, people are trying to figure out like, you know, how do you use and raise a horse and care for a horse? A lot of these things about like the health of the horse eventually become important. And also your ability to apply technology to control the horse to do what you want it to do. So one of the seminal inventions in horse domestication was the introduction of the bit and the bridle. Mm-hmm. Okay. And that probably happened around 1500 BCE. And we know that because of analysis of skeletal remains in the steppes of Mongolia around these things called deer stones, which are these, these stone monoliths that are intricately carved with these beautiful pictures of deer um, and also humans, which they were originally thought to be like human burial sites, kind of like um, mounds like in the, the Barrow Rites uh, in England. But these generally don't actually have that many human remains, but they have lots of horses. And it's usually just the skulls of the horses that have been arranged in particular orientations around the mound facing like east for example Mm -hmm. and so it was it was obviously some sort of ritual around the sacrifice of these very valuable animals and because they have these deer stones that were collect that were established over you know a thousand fifteen hundred year period they can look at the changes in the skulls Mm. and the teeth of the horses over time to look at what they must have been doing in terms of their dentistry and so you know one thing that's really clear is that when they started using reins you can see that the the, the horse's noses, the, the nasal bone started to tilt left because Mongolian riders hold the reins with their left hand and their spear with the right. Oh, interesting. And so they're tugging constantly on the left side of the horse's nose. And actually over years, the horse's nose will start to bend a little bit to the left. The bones will, will adapt. Who knew? Wow. Right. Who knew? And so similarly, when they in, in, introduced you know, the metal bit, which was preceded by a leather bit, which was not damaging to the teeth. But when they use the metal bit, now suddenly it starts to bang into the hind teeth and you get groove marks across the, the premolars of the, to- of the horse. And so you can see these dents appearing in the horse, you know, sacred sites. Now, the, in modern dentistry in Mongolia, the, the Mongolian herders, when they have a cult, like a, a yearling, will, um, uh, this seems to me very dangerous, they will tackle the horse, pin the horse down, and then use a pair of pliers or screwdrivers to pull out these deciduous, the deciduous teeth, which are like the baby teeth, um, because sometimes they impair the, the eruption of the, the final adult teeth. But they also remove what are like, like, like wisdom teeth, which are called wolf teeth, which are these canines that are right in front of the premolars. Um, and they will pull them out because those are the teeth that bang into the bit mm-hmm. and get damaged. And when they get damaged or broken or infected, then the horse will not take the bit and the horse will not be rideable. And so you have to pull these teeth out. And so what they wanted to know is like, was there evidence of the Mongolians 
doing that thousands of years ago? And the answer was yes. So the, hmm. at the transition from the Bronze Period, the, the removal of the wolf teeth was very rare. But by the early Iron Age, when they obviously had bits because it was now the Iron Age, um, and you could see the grooves in the premolars, they were systematically pulling the wolf teeth from these horses as, as early as like 1200 BCE would be 3,300 years ago. They've that's, been that's yanking out teeth. And they would do it usually not by pulling them, but by sawing them off using a flint Ooh, oh, or that a just, little saw. I'm, that just gave uh, me the heebie-jeebies. And you got to imagine that the horse has got to be, you know, unhappy with this uh, and yeah. likely to kick and bite and like stomp you. And it must be very dangerous, but, but it, it was essential to their survival to be able to do this. Because if the horse dies, the horse owner is in trouble. And they do say never look a gift horse in the mouth, which has to do with the, the size teeth. of the teeth, right? That's right. That's absolutely right. Yeah. That's absolutely right. So I thought it was kind of an interesting Where study. Where do you find this stuff, Chris? Usually in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Scientists, which is, I, I just, I have to say, is one of my favorite journals. Okay. Because they, they cover everything and, and they're like totally cool about about taking stuff like equine dentistry as being. Yeah, there you and, go. And beer making in and ancient beer making China. In ancient, yeah. Same thing. Okay. Um, all right. So for mine, um, this is a little bit of a sort of a, uh, just an interesting a paper that, that illustrated an interesting phenomenon, in my opinion. So I don't know the year that this came out. I don't, I can't, uh, it looks like it's 2014, maybe. I can't read. I made it so small that I can't actually read. There was a fake article that came out. Okay, it was a. This was an article. Did I publish it? It was. You did. You did. No, this was a real article. Obviously, it was an article. It was a blog type thing or news uh, media article, but it was fake. And the title of it was "American Psychiatric Association Makes It Official: Selfie, a Mental Disorder." <laughs> so they made up this fake mental disorder that didn't exist, and it was something called. I don't know how you pronounce it exactly. It was selfieitis, essentially, or selfitis. I don't know which one it is. That claimed there was this mental disorder around taking selfies, and they were very specific about it. They gave it different uh, gradients of of uh, how it could be diagnosed, and a lot of turned out a lot of um, news outlets picked this up and thought it was real. So that if you look at Altmetric, uh, the Altmetric citation had fifteen hundred um, citations, one hundred seventy five news outlets picked it up. Um, so this was you know people seem to believe the joke. Okay. I like it. So then, just recently in 2018, and I don't know for sure, I'm, I'm going to just be clear that I am very susceptible to believing things that are jokes are real. So I don't know whether this is real or not, but it seems to, all, all the digging I could do, I don't I, see anything to suggest I that this is fake. I assume that you had like a team of fact checkers here that was like towing away in the that's background. What, that's what Nick like, does. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. Great. We don't good, deal good, with good. facts. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so this was an article that is published just recently, so in 2018, in the International Journal of mental health addiction, and the study is titled "An Exploratory Study of Selfitis, Selfitis, and the Development of the Selfitis, Selfitis Behavior Scale." So I'll just give you the 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 abstract for this. So that in 2014, uh, stories appeared in, na in national and international media claiming that the condition of selfitis, the obsessive taking of selfies, was to be classified as a mental disorder by the American Psychiatric Association. The condition could be could be borderline, acute, and chronic. However, the stories were a hoax, but that did not stop empirical research being carried out on the concept. The present study empirically explored the concept and collected data on the existence of selfitis with respect to three alleged levels, borderline, acute, and chronic, and developed the selfitis behavior scale. Initially, focus group interviews with 225 Indian University students were carried out to generate potential items for the SBS, the Selfie Behavioral Scale. Uh, it was then validated in 400 Indian University students via exploratory factor analysis. Six factors were identified in the EFA, the exploratory factor analysis comprising environmental enhancement, social competition, attention-seeking, mood modification, self-confidence, and social conformity. In other words, somebody made up a fake condition that then led people to research the condition that now claims they can confirm the condition. Now, I don't actually believe that this actually confirms the condition. It's just one, you know, one since study. Since it doesn't exist. Since it may or may not exist. But I just thought it was amusing that you have this like fake story that led to people actually doing actual research on a fake thing that then they now confirm they believe is a real thing. And then we got hate mail for the asparagus I story. I know. Thing, right? Crazy, Jeez. huh? I love science. Um, one interesting <laughs> thing that I thought was funny, they did this in India. They say, 
uh, because India accounts for more selfie-related deaths in the world compared to any other country. With well, that's a biased by population, reported, surely. Well, no, it is by pop, but I mean, it's just in absolute numbers. <laughs> with a reported 76 deaths reported out of a total of 127 worldwide since 2014, those deaths usually occur when people attempt to take a selfie in dangerous contexts, such as in water, from heights, in the proximity of moving vehicles like trains, and while posing with weapons. <laughs> <laughs> you have to add to that one, like there is some zoo, like wild animal zoo in, yeah. in, in, in China oh, sure. recently. This person got eaten by a leopard or a, a tiger or something. Right. When they got out selfie? to take selfies. While taking selfies. <laughs> in, the, in, the, wow. in the feline, uh, just... the feline enclosure. Yeah. <laughs> Didn't work out well. It never does. It's a serious condition. We shouldn't laugh at it. We shouldn't. No, no, no. No, we shouldn't. Good point. All right. Well, that gets us to the end of the program. If you have any feedback on this or any other episode, or you want to suggest a study or topic for us to take on, which more and more people have been doing, and we really appreciate we get to as many as we we can, but uh, we can only do so many. So you can tweet us at at PopHealthyX, or you can tweet me at at ProfMattFox, or you can tweet Chris at, at id.gill, or you can tweet Jen at, at Jennifer Ryder. Jennifer R. Ryder. Sorry, Jennifer R. Ryder. Or uh, if you still want to talk to Don, you can tweet him at, at dtheo1. Or you can find us on the Population Health Exchange website at www.pophealthdx.org. We want to thank Leslie Talalian, Director of Lifelong Learning at BU School of Public Health, for supporting the podcast, and Nick Guler for sound and editing. Thanks for joining us. We hope you enjoyed it, and we hope you will download our next episode. 